well, that's pretty easy, like that boat right there. <clears throat> and then I saw him turn around and go the other way, and I thought, how does that work? <laughs> so I better go to school. <clears throat> so I went to the Maritime Academy, and, and I've been working uh, on vessels for 53 years, I guess. Um, I've done a lot of work on most of the ferry boats here in the bay, construction, management, design, redesign, repowers, things like that. So at one of their meetings, uh, their, the WIDA, Water Emergency Transit Authority, is under um, pressure, if you will. People keep saying, well, why don't you have hybrid vessels? Why don't you have green vessels? So <clears throat> I put this presentation together to kind of answer that question. And I'm not saying no, I'm not saying yes. I'm saying, what a, you know, let's look at what it is. So uh, now, how do we work this part? OK. But I want to. OK. OK, got it. So what is a hybrid? That's the first question. Everybody knows about Prius and things like that, but um, the word hybrid means, uh, in this case, the offspring of two plants or animals, uh, hybrid of wheat and rye, roses. I got a picture of a mule there, which is a definite hybrid. Uh, <clears throat> why hybrid? Well, the objective is to minimize pollution and fossil fuel use, which is causing the pollution. It, it can use renewable energy and battery storage for power. Why do we want to do that? If you look at this picture of the Earth, which I'm sure we've all seen, take a really good look at the outer edge. And there's only 60 miles high versus 8,000 miles diameter of atmosphere. And, and uh, most of that atmosphere is in the lower, like you go in an airplane, they're just about out of the atmosphere. So there isn't much air, so we've got to take care of it. The current vessels, uh, this is the new Hydrus class for Water Emergency Transit Authority here in the bay. There's four of these. Two are here and three, two more coming. And um, they're diesel powered. Well, why are they diesel powered? And we'll get to that. What about emissions? Uh, minimizing emissions was part of our goal. So if you look at this chart, it shows uh, what tier one emissions were before 1996. And these are EPA, U.S. EPA rules, and the, the other countries are, have similar rules. Uh, so Tier 1 was 96, Tier 2 was 2004. And if you envision the volume in those blue blocks, you could see that Tier 2 was about 15% of Tier 1. And the previous, uh, Tier 0, let's say, is as big as this whole page. And then Tier 3 came a few little later, and now Tier 4 interim and Tier 4 final. So the new ferries were, are running at Tier 4 final. Which, And you look at that little chip compared to the, the big Tier 1 blue block, that's how, how lower the emissions are than the original one. Somebody's going to say, what about CO2? Well, that's a good question because CO2 is not involved in this chart. The CO2 is actually the same as it was before, just about. So this is how that, that's accomplished on the new ferries. This is one of the engines, a picture of the engine out of the Hydrus class. Um, all the Golden Gate boats use this same engine. The Vallejo boats use this engine. They're between 1,800 and 2,500 horsepower each. So they burn a lot of fuel. But that box that I circled there has got a catalytic converter in it, and they inject urea, which is uh, used for, for lawn food among other things, is injected there. And that cuts the nitrous oxide, which is, <clears throat> you can't see it from here, but if you look down towards San Jose often on a spare the air day, you'll see a brown haze, tan haze. A tan haze is, is nitrous oxide, not good for people. Um, so we can talk about vessels. We go all electric vessels. You got that Buick there from 1901 or so, maybe even earlier than that, that's all batteries. You got an Italian, uh, little Italian car there with an Italian fashion statement in it. <laughs> and then a Tesla, which most people are familiar with. Um, amazing car. 
So let's move to boats for a minute. This is the Ampere Norway, which is all electric. Um, Joe Brigard went over and saw this boat and rode on it, if you want to ask him about it later. Why do we have hybrid? It's a um, carbon footprint reduction is the main reason. Energy savings, whether you want to save it for yourself or your neighbors or money is, uh, is some other reasons. The energy source is clean. Like when you look at a zero emission bus downtown in San Francisco or any city, it says zero emission. Well, that's true as long as they get the electricity to charge the batteries from a clean source. Like in San Francisco, it's great because we have Hetch Hetchy Reservoir and the dam and PG&E and solar, et cetera. Um, and then public preference for hybrids is, is gaining power. Hybrid examples, um, golf cart, BMW, Toyota, et cetera, cars, 50 miles to the gallon plus. Uh, Hornblower cruises, we'll see some pictures of those. The Matthew Turner sailing ship, I don't know if you're aware of that, but we're building a sailing ship in Sausalito that is um, 135 feet long, and it's got sails plus a hybrid plant and, the, and batteries, so the objective is we'll charge the batteries under sail when the propellers are windmilling. Um, Red and White Fleet's new tour boat, which we'll see a picture of here in a minute, is a true hybrid with the same plant, a little bit bigger than the Matthew Turner. Here's a Toyota Prius, 50 miles per gallon. Uh, that's the biggest selling hybrid in the world. Surprising to me, BMW is right behind Toyota in, in hybrids, and in the United States, GM is out selling, is right up there with them. And this particular car, it has the carpool sticker. It's a plug-in hybrid. It goes zero to 60 in five and a half seconds. It'll go 150 miles an hour, and it gets 69 miles to the gallon. But there's a catch, <laughs> and I'll show you that later. And that wasn't the price tag. It was only $200 more than the same car with the standard four-cylinder engine gas engine. Uh, a World War II submarine. This is um, the, the Pompanito at, uh, down at Pier 45 is a true hybrid. It's got a diesel engine, big batteries. It can go underwater for overnight, let's say, and um, come back up and charge the batteries. So it's a hybrid. Or it can run on, on the diesel engines, making electricity turning the propellers. And that was built in 1944. Or 42. Now this one surprised me. <clears throat> Formula One hybrid race cars. These are the quickest, fastest cars in the world, and now they're hybrids. So they've got a, a very small engine that puts out about 700 horsepower, and then a battery pack, which is also quite small, relatively speaking, to the BMW and Toyotas. And when they break coming into a turn, that's just jamming power, electricity, into those batteries. And then they accelerate. They've got a battery full of, of power to go with that engine, and they, they fly. And they get considerably better mileage, fuel mileage, which is important so they don't have to make as many stops. And these are all hybrid cars now. It's just taken over the, the track. Um, tugboats, you see a lot of tugboats in the bay. Foss has two tugboats that are hybrid. They went... The first one was done 10 or 12 years ago. The second one, 8 or 10 years ago. So a question we might think about is, okay, how come Foss has 80 tugboats and only two of them are hybrids? And the Port of Long Beach paid for the upgrades to the hybrids, and I'll show you later. Hornblower kind of has led the, um, the tour boat business in terms of hybrids. They started out in 2009. And the Alcatraz boat was the first one, and the reason for that was the Park Service gave, gave Hornblower a lot of points when they awarded them the contract, taking it away from blue and gold, um, because they proposed that they would provide a hybrid vessel. You know, green is better, so they, they got that contract, and it's a big one. They then did a fuel cell hybrid in 2012, and we'll see some fuel cell stuff at the end. Um, Dr. Pratt here is a Golden Gate Zero hybrid expert and entrepreneur. 
So maybe he'll be your speaker soon, but, but they're in the process of building a fuel cell hybrid vessel. This hybrid research vessel I put in here because it has the same power plant as what we have in the uh, Matthew Turner, which came from a bus. There are between six and 7,000 buses with that exact same system. So it's not new technology per se, but in marine it's relatively new. And this is a second hybrid that's built with the same system that Matthew Turner has. Here's Red and White's newest, it's a hybrid boat. Um, this one will be uh, delivered in a few months, Joe, is that right? August. August, so it'll, it'll be uh, here in San Francisco Bay operating. This is the Matthew Turner that we're building in Sausalito. It's an all-volunteer, or mostly volunteer effort and educational tall ship foundation, and we need money, so if you've got any workers or money out there. Staff Charlie Hart spoke, right? yeah. yeah, Charlie Hart. This is the engine room in that boat before we filled it up with battery packs and inverters and mufflers and all kinds of things. How much do hybrids cost? These two pallets of equipment next to that ladder, they're about this high, $340,000 for those two pallets. So even though it's not new, it's not cheap either. And then the, on the right side there is the, the uh, motor, which is a bus motor, electric motor, that coupled through a drive shaft to a propeller, and that's the starboard side there. And that was 250000 which is pretty standard pricing. Um, Europe has been pushing for this for longer than we have, it seems like. Well, going, thinking of the hybrid example, I mean the hornblower example, maybe not longer. But they've got a lot of push for green. And uh, this is a, a design, new design. And notice it says carbon fiber hull. And we'll talk about that when we get to powering. This is a Norway hybrid cat in Norway. Norway has a lot of uh, hydro dams and generation from hydropower, which is as green as you can get. And so therefore, there, there's a big push there for electric powered vessels. Two new ferries, this is recent, uh, like a month, two months ago, two new ferries were announced to be down in the, Car in the Gulf of Gulf of Mexico, um, Alabama, and somewhere near there. There's a picture of it. And they're, they're changing out electric horsepower, uh, taking out diesel engines and putting in electric motors. Um, more Scandinavian ferries, battery types. There's lots of different batteries. So which one do you choose? <clears throat> well, it depends on what you want to do and how much they cost. Now this is a comparison of hybrids, and on the top I have a truck going up a hill. And then what goes up the hill must come down the hill. So you get regeneration with the, with the truck or whatever. If it's a hybrid, it charges its battery coming down the hill. And on the bottom left, we have a boat that's going up over the waves, a Coast Guard boat. And we have a pleasure boat that's going uphill. And then we have a boat that's going to be going uphill for a long time. <laughs> He should have been looking out the window. Um, and then on the bottom, you see that red line on that curve? As you go from, as, you, as a boat, a displacement hull, or an airplane, or things going through the fluid and air, the faster you go, the more energy you use. But it isn't a straight line. It's a cube function, almost a cube function in most cases, so that to go <clears throat> twice as fast takes... 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 takes 8 times the power. And that continues right up until the speed of light. So EMC squared is, doesn't take much energy, but all that velocity goes up that steep curve. Okay, now this, this is the most important slide in the whole presentation, I think. And it talks about, it, what it is is a picture from my BMW screen and it shows where the power that you used in the last however long you have this before you reset it. Um, <clears throat> and the red is, is gasoline power. The light blue is charge power from when I'm plugged into PG&E. 
are actually Marin Clean Energy. It's 100% green. And, uh, and the dark blue is regenerative. In other words, when I, when I put on my brakes, it, rather than the brake pads grabbing, it's recharging the batteries, and it's amazingly efficient. The, there's no battery, no, no uh, brake dust on the rotors or anything. It's, it's most of the time it's using that motor to stop the car. So that's a, a blueprint, let's say, or a picture, a snapshot of, of the, how the power is put together, you know, what you use to get that power. And it depends. If, if you take the car, and a, and a Prius does the same thing, if you take the car and you go from here to New York City, it's going to be 90%, 95% red gasoline. And every time you put on your brake, which isn't very often on the freeway, you get the dark blue regen. And then you go to the hotel and you plug in at night, and that's a small sliver. But if you took a, a bus, a hybrid bus from San Francisco, especially with the hills, and you looked at their chart, it would probably look very similar to this or even less red because they have fast charges. They come in for coffee break, 15 minutes. They plug that bus in, and 15 minutes later, it's fully charged again. So they don't use very much diesel. So just bear that in mind that, that your load profile, I'll call it, is based on how you're driving and where you're going. With a boat, you don't. what we're going to do with the Matthew Turner is we'll charge the batteries. Let, let's start out with a full charge of batteries, leave the dock, get under sail, and we use some electricity out of the batteries to run the propellers, get under sail, go out under the bridge, go back to Sausalito, under sail, and the propellers are windmilling, so it's charging the battery. So in theory, we'll never need to use the diesel engine in that profile. But if we're going to go from here to Stockton at 2 o'clock in the morning, let's say, where there's no wind, you're going upriver, you're going to be using diesel power. So... All of these hybrid plants you do, do this triangle or this graphic here one way or another. So do we need uh, fuel cells on our ferry boats? This is why the current ferry boats are not hybrids. If you take a look at batteries, a gallon of diesel oil or gasoline, it's almost the same energy per gallon, equals about 36 kilowatt hours of batteries. So what does that look like? See that ferry boat there? It has two tanks of 1,450 gallons of diesel oil, and that white box in the middle is about, let's say, 1,450 gallons. The energy in that white box, if we had batteries in the containers on that ship, it's 20 containers full. And batteries are heavy. So on a high-speed ferry, that isn't going to work. First of all, It'll sink the boat. It reminds me of a, a friend of mine um, who said, is famous for having said, how do you know when you have enough anodes on your boat? Or zincs. How do you know when you have enough zincs on your boat? It sinks. <laughs> so, so that's what we got going here. Uh, again, voyage characteristics. Remember that circle with the triangles in it. Here's a route profile, and um, it says when you're, you're at the dock, <clears throat> and then you're, you power up, and you're transiting, and then you maneuver and come back to the dock. How much energy do you use over a period of time? So this will convert, to again, to the circle with the triangles in it. I put this one in here because um, it's, it's thought to be that Okay, we want to use this. We want to run this engine at its most efficient point, and that's why we use batteries so we can, you know, we can run the engine when it, it's running full and hard and, and not so much when it's not very efficient. We use the batteries instead. Like uh, Ron was on an airplane all day, and when they were in JFK this morning, they stayed at the, at the, the gate, and then they backed out, went right to the track or to the runway and took off, they didn't go out there and idle and line up like they used to because those gas turbine engines on the airplane are very inefficient fuel-wise at low power. So I put this chart in because diesel engines, current production diesel engines, 
from, from fully efficient to the worst case is only about 10% because of the common rail fuel systems and electronic controls and so forth. The efficiency doesn't change very much. So that kind of takes the argument of, well, we'll run, when we, we'll idle on batteries, we won't run the engine, and we'll only run the engine when, when it's full power. So that argument doesn't hold water very much anymore. Here's some comparisons of, of uh, how much emissions you would have with two different scenarios, a, a boat, one boat, one ferry boat with two engines, and another ferry boat with one engine and batteries. Still doesn't pencil out in most cases. It, this specific one was done for, for uh, Treasure Island from San Francisco Ferry Dock. And in that case, it, it does pencil out. The boat doesn't have to go fast, which is, remember that root curve. Um, and so it, it is a pretty good comparison. This is just showing the BAE hybrid system, which is what we have and Joe has, and um, just the components. This is a wiring, this is the biggest part of the wiring diagram. There's probably a million wires in there. Um, conservation, that's another way to do it. New hull forms, as you know with your sailboats, that the, the hull forms have changed over the years and they're faster and lighter. Changing schedules is uh, ships that are coming in here that come up from Los Angeles or go the other way, Long Beach, they, uh, they have changed their schedules so that they, they take a little longer so they don't have to go quite as fast and be up on that high power part of the curve. They've optimized the vessels to the loads. Um, the ferry boats here, same thing. We've optimized the vessels for the loads, the passenger count. And, and a big push in the last series of boats is bicycles, which get great mileage. <laughs> but uh, we've had to add, the last boats are 135 feet long, and about 25 feet of that is to carry bicycles. So that's, they're expensive in terms of having that much aluminum to carry the bikes, but it doesn't detract from the hull speed. It just becomes longer. I mean, a very minor distract, detraction. Efficiency of the components, they're pretty well pushed to, to the limit at this point, as are your sailing vessels. Hybridization is another way to get there, in like in the Treasure Island case. Um, these are the WIDA boats. They're, they're almost, I could almost say ultralights. They're, the plating on those hulls is uh, thinner than you would think, but it's really tough stuff. So they're light, and they're fast. The best current cost scenario for zero emissions is renewable diesel. <clears throat> now, what's renewable diesel? I thought, well, there's biofuel, and biofuel is made from French fry oil and, and uh, you know, animal fats, vegetable fats. Renewable diesel is made from the same start stock, but it's processed a different way. So um, it's, it's actually like probably 80%. You get 80% of the energy out of what energy you put in to make the stuff, whereas in biofuel, it's not nearly that good. And the city of San Francisco has switched their entire fleet to renewable diesel. Um, Oakland is following suit, and I don't know. Are you going to use that, Tom? Probably. Uh, yeah, we, we've been using this since I mean, Joe? <laughs> Yeah, the catch is that. Okay, Joe uh, Joe Vergard from Red and White Fleet says that they they will be using it in October. I'm sorry, you what? Ben, oh, they've been using it since October. The kind of the catch to that is that the engine companies are saying, well, we don't know about this stuff, so we're not going we're going to avoid your warranty, and uh, it isn't quite that simple. So Golden Gate's putting out an RFP for getting some boats built, and they, they put in the contract, you shall use renewable diesel. So the shipyard turns that back to the diesel people, the engine people, and says, you shall use renewable diesel if you want to be in this boat. They'll figure out a way. It has not been a single problem with the San Francisco bus system that I've heard, bus and trucks and cars. and Fuel cells, what's a fuel cell? And they've been around for, I don't know, how, how long, Joe? 150 years. 150 years. 
And all of the spacecraft and the space station are, are powered by fuel cells. So again, it's not new, but it's new to the Coast Guard. <laughs> That's not fun. Um, so it takes, hydro it takes hydrogen, which is made by uh, the simplest way as electrolysis of the water out here is oxygen and hydrogen. And then when, it, when the cell works, it turns it back to water. And you use electricity to, to do that process. And probably, if you're lucky, Dr. Joe Pratt here will talk to you at lunch someday about this. So here's a fuel, innovative fuel cell ferry that I saw one time a few years ago. I couldn't resist this. <laughs> these, these guys are they're leaving Cuba. And they've strapped these barrels to the truck, and they took the drive shaft and put a propeller on it. Pretty good, huh? Did they make it? They made it. Yeah, they did. <laughs> so that's the end, but I got one more thing to share. I was doing a, my, my grandson's in the fourth grade, so they asked me to do a science project. So I did one on what floats your boat, about displacement and stuff. And... I was in somebody's office, and I found this on a coffee cup. And I thought, this is good. <laughs> so that's it. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. We're visiting today with Charlie Walther, a maritime engineer with an unlimited license. How many people have 50-ton uh, licenses, 100-ton licenses? How about unlimited? Charlie knows a little bit about this game. So, Charlie, um, talk to us for just a little bit about how much fuel right now you'd need to take a ship from Taiwan to San Francisco. <clears throat> Diesel. Diesel. Um, the ship would do a container ship. Let's say, will do about. Uh, is there about? They're going to run at about eighty thousand horsepower, and they're going to use something like um, four hundred tons a day, three hundred fifty tons a day of fuel. And uh, the bulk carriers that you see come in to go to Stockton and Sacramento. Those ships are are relatively low horsepower. They're about. Uh, 16 to 18,000 horsepower. The car carrier, same thing, 16 to 18,000 horsepower. So the amount of horsepower is what causes the fuel to get burned up. If you're going to make horsepower, you use fuel. So how much would that cost? Oh. How much fuel? I haven't thought about this for a long time, but, uh, well, fuel is about $300 a ton for the black oil that these ships use. Another interesting thing is when they get 200 miles offshore, they have to switch over to clean diesel, ultra-low sulfur clean diesel, to come into an eco zone, which is environmentally controlled area. So when they, if you think back even five years ago, the ships would come in here and there'd be a big, usually blue-gray cloud or dark brown cloud coming out of that stack. And now they don't do that. It's ultra-low clean diesel. And so what's the difference in cost if you were to take the same ship and have hybrid power to go from here, from Taiwan to here? Either you'd have to have a really long extension cord <laughs> or it would sink. You just, <laughs> you just can't do it. So right now, so give us the pictures of what kind of, what's the time frame before we're going to have a, a purely hybrid a solution for tankers like that size? Well... Going in that direction before I answer that question directly, um, Crowley Maritime and, and Salt Chuck, the tote companies in Seattle, Crowley being here, have both ordered and, and received two uh, big ships. They're about 850, 900 feet and um, 30,000, 40,000 tons cargo capacity. And they are using LNG, liquid natural gas and they have big tanks on them and the the big diesel engines will <clears throat> will eventually run on it they're not so, two of them are not 
burning that yet because of getting the liquid LNG to the ship, delivering it to the ship in tanks. But that's, that's the direction where the world's going right now. Um, Hybrid-wise, I hate to say it, but it won't be in my lifetime, I don't think, because of the battery technology. Mm -hmm. You know, something else is going to have to come <clears throat> along, and, and Dr. Pratt could talk to using hydrogen. Maybe there's some ways to do that. So what's the time frame for the liquid natural gas solution? Oh, they're building them now. There, are, I don't know how many ships in the world, but there's probably 50 ships using it now. So it's current, and that, that fuel is cheaper than diesel oil and black oil. Diesel, ultra-low sulfur diesel costs about almost twice as much as the black oil. Is this going to be the solution? Is this the, the route we're going to first go to um, some this technology before we get to a hybrid or the next generation of some other technology? Is this the next thing that's going to happen? Let's see. Liquid Tim, natural gas? Tim Cook is with Donald Trump this week. I think we'll have to ask him what comes <laughs> next. I mean, it, it has to be a leap of technology uh -huh. that we don't have yet. So liquid natural gas solutions, you're saying that's, less, that's going to cost less money? Yes. And so um, given the price differential, give us some sense about when we might get to 1% with a new solution and, and what do you imagine as adoption curve? To look like well it depends on the availability you know it's available in probably anywhere in the world pretty much but the port for the port to be able to handle it and by the port I mean private industry uh, being able to handle it with the barges and that infrastructure to get built out is 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 going to be a delay <clears throat> Washington State ferries uh, talked about doing this and studied the LNG about um, 10 years ago, they had a big push because they could see LNG was going to get cheaper. Well, they nobody realized it was going to get that much cheaper than diesel, but it did, is. And um, do they have it in their boats? Nope. It's, it's, the, the Coast Guard there was a big stumbling block on, in terms of safety of carrying natural gas or hydrogen aboard your vessel. Mm-hmm. So we're going to take questions from the audience. And Lenny, you have a question. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. I'm wondering about other countries like Japan and Russia. Is everybody in the world trying to do what we're trying to do And countries like Norway? And can you answer that for me? Yeah. Su surprisingly, in a good way, they are, even the Russians. And I think the Russians are because it's cheaper. And uh, the the other European countries are are because uh, it's safer. Uh, not safer, it's, it's better for the environment, safer for the environment. Mm -hmm. Johnny. I have a question. What portion of the fuel consumption is offshore versus near shore? For a container ship for, from Japan or China, for example? Generally, the, the, the ferries and, and, and near shore vessels versus the ones that are offshore. It all comes down to horsepower hours. So depending on how much horsepower you're using for how long, that's what determines it. But in terms of the ferries, um, the Vallejo ferries run about 45, 45 minutes out of an hour will be at full power. And um, Golden Gate, I call it their service factor. So if you're, if you're burning... 100% power for three quarters of an hour and a quarter of it at 10% power, you're at a service factor of 0.7, 7, something like that. The Golden Gate ferries are 0.43, and the, the WIDA ferries to Oakland Alameda are 0.41. So let me ask a question, um, John's question in a slightly different way. So of all commercial powerboat traffic, what percent is the big ships that go around the globe, and what percent are in bays and harbors with ferry boats and, and near shore traffic? What percent? Okay, the, I've seen numbers recently from in the world in terms of emission from ships, and there's about 80,000 ships in the world bigger than 5,000 tons. There's a lot more than we see coming in here. It's amazing how many. And th three of them sink every day somewhere in the world. <laughs> Three ships sink every day? Yeah. What On kind average. of ships? The ships you see coming in here. Not, well, not little. But some country, the, the flags in some countries have got to have 
better rates than others. What countries are sinking the fastest? <laughs> we want nobody shorting the stocks of... Okay, so which, company, which countries are having a tougher go of it, let's say? Um, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> Good. I understand. But it's not, it's not the United States or England or Norway or... Liberia? Well, Liberian ships, I don't know what percentage of Chevron and Exxon's fleets are Liberian, so that doesn't... That, that's just a flag of convenience. It isn't where the ship operators really come from. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Um, I, uh, I think I understand exactly why uh, hybrid technology for marine applications would work really well for systems where the electricity is supplied by uh, a fuel cell. And, Ron, I actually do vote in favor of getting Dr. Pratt in here to talk about that. I think that would and be And we will. Good, good suggestion, yes. But um, I'm a little unclear on the um, on the benefits of uh, of of hybrid technology when the source of electricity is diesel or natural gas. I mean, I think I can see the benefit for low duty cycle applications if you can charge it up and you plug it in. Like you say, these buses can be charged up in 15 minutes. If you can do that with a ferry, where you know, you're going back and forth to Alcatraz and you, you, you spend almost as much time or more time probably loading and un unloading passengers relative to the time you're, you spend moving around. I guess I can see how sort of that really can be beneficial. But in longer haul container ship tanker type applications, uh, it, it seems that I heard you say that you can't even get the benefit of running the engine full blast and, and using it efficiently and then shutting it down and cycling it that way because these days they, it runs pretty efficiently across a wide power band. So I'm not clear I understand the benefit of hybrid technology when the source is a fossil fuel um, for longer haul applications. Is there, an, is there a benefit? And if so, what is it? Well, you went right to the heart of what I've been trying to say here for an hour. <clears throat> Thank you. If you, if, if you are using... Um, diesel fuel, or say a non-renewable source for that power to power the batteries, it works very well. Remember the graph where we had the truck going up over the hill and coming back down? And you have a city bus going up a hill and coming down or going from one street to the next and putting on his brakes. He's regenerating. <clears throat> so in that case, you are saving quite a bit of energy. You're, you're using the energy that's normally given off as heat in the brakes, which is significant. So in that case, uh, you, you are. But remember the other graph, that same picture where the boats were all going uphill? Well, a boat or a ship or an airplane, for that matter, is always going uphill, except for the few instances in, in minutes and seconds where they're coming into the dock. And um, so you could get a little bit of electricity there, but not much. Regen. You could maybe on the, the ferries here in the bay, you might regen... Two percent, something like that. You say when they're coming into the docks, you mean because the, their stern wake is going to catch up with them and surf them forward? What causes it when you're going into the dock? Why do you get regen then? Because uh, if... Now, here's something you might be interested in. If you're in your sailboat out here and a ferry boat's bearing down on you, and all of a sudden the guy wakes up and looks out the window and goes, oh my God, and he throws it full astern, what's going to happen? Used to be he'd kill his engines and run right over you. Well, what happens now is the the computer controls in there, when he pulls it straight back, the engine goes down to neutral. It, it shuts off the fuel. It leaves it in gear until the boat slows to almost stop. Slow enough that... So it's turning the prop. It's You're turning it like a windmill. It's, it's windmilling the prop, and the engine is breaking the boat. Well, it could. If, if you had a hybrid system, the engine could be charging the battery instead okay. of... So you'd, using reverse. The boat so you'd, you'd use the prop to slow the boat into the dock rather than use reverse? Well, that's what they do now. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, when they come in, they don't just drop it in neutral or astern. They'll leave it in slow ahead for a little while to slow the boat down. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing you do with the Matthew Turner when you're under sail power. You're using the yeah. prop like a windmill to gen power off the props of the, under the boat. That's right. Okay. And how much are we going to get out of that? Poquito. Nobody seems to know. <laughs> but you're the engineer, I know. Charlie. And so I looked all over the world, and there's, there's almost no information about how, how efficient the prop would be. So I asked the, 
the two companies, the two best companies I've worked with for 40 years, how much are we going to get? And they go, I'm not sure. <laughs> so we'll find out. <laughs> we'll come back to that. We have another question from the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for coming in today. Uh, I just had a quick question about the heavy fuel oil, which is incredibly dirty. And I was wondering what you think it would take to start phasing it out and how it compares emissions-wise to LNG, if that's the fuel of the future. Okay, how do you phase it out? Uh, that is happening. There's uh, IMO, International Maritime Organization, has got a set of rules, pending rules right now, to phase it out. Um, it is incredibly dirty. It's incredibly full of power, though, and it's what left over after we make uh, lighter fluid, gasoline, <clears throat> liquid petroleum gas, and all that stuff. It's what's left over. So what can we do with it after that? We'll use it to pave roads. Um, and what was the second part? Uh, how the emissions compare. Oh, emission comparison. Very important question. If you look at the total amount of of CO2 produced from black oil, which is not much different than gasoline or diesel, the amount of energy it takes um, to use, a, let's say, a gallon of that, compared to the energy in a gallon of LNG, it's about, the LNG is about a third, even less than a third less, or more than a third less CO2 per per energy of unit. You see, unit it's 30% less polluting? More, it's, it's like 40-something percent less, less polluting, polluting. just by, by uh, energy use. So we're visiting today at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon with Charlie Walther. Um, fascinating. And we have another question from the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, Charlie. Uh, thanks very much for talking today about this you know, very important and kind of timely topic in regards to our energy future. Uh, two questions about batteries. Um, I was reading recently about the Boeing uh, 787 mishaps with their lithium-ion uh, batteries and how I guess they're about the size of a paperback uh, book versus the Tesla automobile where they have an active cooling system and the batteries, uh, individual cells are about the size of a AA battery. But I was wondering if you're, um, the battery packs that are, you're putting in hybrid systems are... Um, have avoidance as far as runaway um, and fire risk. And also the second question is, as far as battery technology, do you see battery energy storage approaching a gallon of uh, fuel, either gasoline or diesel in, in the future? Okay, first off, battery safety. Um, those two tugboats that I showed, the picture of the FOSS boats, the hybrid boats, they had a battery fire in the first one. Boeing had the problem with the 787 batteries and so what did Boeing do about it? They did a big study. They landed all the planes, and it took many months, but they ended up putting them in a stainless steel enclosure, and it's about the size of your car battery, maybe a little bit bigger. So on the Matthew Turner... Wait, so is that just to contain the fire? Yes. In a safety, as a safety precaution? Right. It doesn't prevent the fire or minimize the fire? Correct. Okay. okay. So to minimize and prevent the fire, Corvus Energy in Canada, British Columbia provided the, uh, the first FOSS boat. Um, and what they did there was they, they changed the program. There's a computer that charges each cell, as with Tesla. And the computer knows the temperature and the amperage rate on each cell in that battery. And the Matthew Turner probably has 400, 500 cells. The computer keeps track of every single cell every second and, and makes adjustments. And so the question is, can that battery ever overheat? And they don't call them fires. This is one of my favorites. They call them thermal runaways. <laughs> A thermal runaway. Thermal runaway. Because they don't burn, or they don't burn with oxygen. They burn from heat. They self-destruct with heat. I, I went to a party school. I remember some thermal runaways. <laughs> Great parties. We have another question from the audience. Hi. Hi. Um, Thanks for coming. It's a very interesting conversation. Uh, we have a real problem with plastic in the ocean, right? In fact, Mike. I read that there's a patch in the middle. Mike there's a Clinton. patch in the middle of the Pacific, several times bigger than the state of Texas. Two x the state of Texas. There are five major gyres. The biggest, is the one you're referring to in the North Pacific, is two x Texas in area and about five feet deep. 
So I've read about a project where uh, to, to have boats that can harvest that plastic, which is, after all, a petrochemical, and then use that to burn for fuel to move boats across the water, across the ocean. Are you familiar with that? Is there any traction there? Is there any possibilities there? Um, I've heard that, but I'm not familiar with it. And I didn't answer the second half of his question, though. Um, battery technology in the future, the energy density, energy density is what it's all about. And no, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't see that happening until, like Steve Jobs and Tim Cook said, we don't know what we're going to invent yet. So by way of, uh, yeah, another question from the audience. Bruce. Um, several years ago, I, I read a lot about ships trying to use sails to reduce fuel consumption out in the ocean. Haven't heard much about that lately. Has that gone anywhere? Is that still possible, or is it kind of a dead letter? No, I think it's still possible. Cal Maritime's going out on their annual cruise here on Sunday or Monday, and they've got a program there to, to test one of those things. And what happens is, that you imagine the spinnaker, spinnaker goes and pays out with a winch, and then and it makes energy as it's paying out, and then magically they get it back in somehow. So, and, and I think they do that by collapsing the sail, so there's hardly any work to get it back, and then they put it up and do it again. So that that's a, seems to make a lot of sense. So you're not describing sailing, you're, you're saying using the wind to generate uh, other kinds of generated power on the boat. Yes. Okay. And, and sail technology too, the spinning sails, on, on uh, tankers and bulk carriers. There, there's a few in the world now. It's not going away. So there's also some kite technology, as you know, in Alameda right now, Google Research is doing, as a big project that Johnny Heineken works on, where they're using kites that are uh, generating power, s separate offshoot of the subject. Yeah, Julia, we have a question from Facebook. We do. Yeah, Ken Gladwell asked if Cal Maritime... Uh, Rear Commodore. Ken. Rear Commodore, Ken Gladwell. <laughs> Ask if uh, Cal Maritime has specific courses on hybridization. Uh, I, I, not that I'm aware of, not at this point, but they probably will. One of their professors did the did the hornblower engineering on those hornblower projects. He's very familiar with it, so they have the resource. So now, when it comes to hybrid engine, is a hybrid engine for the cubic, uh, you know, for the size and uh, number of cubes of the engine, is it just as powerful as a diesel engine? Talk to me, is there any difference in the power for the size of the engine? Well, the hybrids we've been discussing is, is a diesel engine and a battery mm -hmm. and, the, and the processor to connect those two. So did that answer your question? And so what you're going to do is you're going to generate power with the hybrid engine and you're going to use it as an engine and sometimes you're going to be battery powered. Sometimes you're going to be using the, the diesel, sometimes battery. That's what you're talking about. Right. So it's, it's a hybrid. It's part of the hybrid system, but it's a standard diesel engine. It's right. standard from the standpoint of the engine itself. It has, instead of having a generator, in the case of the boats we've been talking about, instead of having a generator separate from the engine, the generator is the flywheel. So in a car, you get uh, efficiencies in the hybrid engine in a car by what means? What, what makes it a hybrid car have lower gas mileage and or higher efficiency if you have to generate the uh, electricity anyway? How does that work? Putting on your brakes. Okay. It's and since you don't get to go downhill or have down, braking, downhill. except when you're going into harbors, so that means long-distance ships are less likely to advantage... Uh, get that advantage than short um, distance shipping. This guy gets it pretty good. Huh? <laughs> barely, that's just exactly, barely. That's exactly it. And and the reason Prius get such good mileage, and those type of cars is because they're light. They're they're very light and have small engines, and so they've optimized that very well. Okay, so now. Lots of people who are sailors recognize that you can plane a boat or you can have a displacement boat. And as you start going faster uh, and you get up on a plane, how much less or more energy does it take to keep the boat on a plane? Like scows, for instance, they seem to go super fast because the faster they go, the less their wetted surface is. So um, first of all, is it the case that as you start to pull the boat out of the water, um, you know, it's got less resistance? 
Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. If you look at that boat right out there, the red and white boat, that's a full displacement hull. And it's as it's going through the water, it's displacing as much water as its shape and its weight. But if you look at the uh, this guy coming along here, that boat has enough power to push itself out of the water. So you don't you don't have to fight the the hull resistance of making a wave, and you and you, and the skin resistance. So the ferry boats, the trick with the ferry boats, they're all aluminum, and that's because they're light, so they don't have as much drag in the water, and they have enough power to. They don't plane, but they they do get up quite a bit more than you would think looking at them. So there's less resistance, they do have less um, surface friction, uh, and they have less wave making and less eddy making. Yeah, I was on a container ship last week and the hydras came by in the estuary at full speed, 28 knots, and that wake wasn't six inches high. Mm -hmm. So now why do we, how, how can that be or is that being applied to big giant ships? One can't imagine a 900 foot liner doing something like that, but how is it used? By putting it across multiple holes, catamaran style, or what? On the big container ships and tankers, no, they're full displacement like this one. Right. But the Navy ships that I, that I worked on the LCS class, um, those are catamarans and trimarans for that reason. And they only draw six or seven feet. And so as they get up on a plane, they start using less fuel and uh, essentially that's their, their form of efficiency because they're displacing less? Yeah, you, you're trading off less fuel in that case for more speed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we did 53 knots on a 1,000-ton ship, 300 feet long, and uh, that's because it wasn't in the water pretty much. But was it using less fuel because it had less efficiency or they, the prop had to rev so much more it didn't, you didn't have a change in fuel efficiency per mile? No, in gallons per mile it was... It was uh, quite efficient compared to a, to a f displacement hull. It was mm -hmm. probably a, a third of what the displacement hull would be. Well, you can't get a displacement hull to go that fast. Mm -hmm. David James. Uh, thank you very much for coming in today. It's been a fascinating uh, conversation. My question goes back to the pie chart that you showed uh, from your BMW, about 50% fuel, about, I don't know, 20% uh, plug-in and about 30%. Uh, regeneration, and uh, I, I guess the headline is that the car gets 70 miles per gallon. How does the EPA measure that? I mean, what what assumption do they make about regeneration versus when you're plugged in versus how much fuel you're using? Are you on the highway, going uphill, downhill? So I'm guessing if you guys are in this room, in this club, you did pretty well in school, right? <laughs> Just my guess now. A pretty big so, assumption, Charlie. So, yeah, well, so... The way they did that, and I, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm just figuring out backwards that um, the, the EPA says, okay, the average person goes 18 miles to work. And so we'll make the, the test for this car to go 18 miles to work, plug it in, and go 18 miles home. Now, my car gets 90 miles to the gallon or more when it's charged up, when I'm on batteries. It's really more. No, it's like 200 miles a gallon. And so, um, so it has a range of about 18 miles. And then you plug it in again. Then you go home. It actually is 13 miles. So it gets 69 miles to the gallon if you do that EPA trip, which includes charging at work. And so they, they studied for the test and got an A. <laughs> in, in reality, though, the car does get... Around just around everywhere driving it, it gets 40 miles to the gallon, and if I do that trip, it gets 80. So now you mentioned that Europe is farther ahead uh, in terms of more hybrid usage than America. Is that because of public sentiment? Are they uh, farther in? They have higher adoption rates because of public sentiment. What's causing it? Well, I, I think I said they were headed in that direction. I don't yeah. know the numbers, but they're. They're headed in that direction kind of faster than we used to be. Mm -hmm. And I think most of it has to do with the, the dams and the hydropower. Because mm -hmm. they've got hydropower that they can plug their vehicles into. But that's only going to help for energy. short that's going to, that's going to help for short trips where you basically can store enough energy to be assisting you. Okay. Right. Another question here. Yeah. Uh, just going back to your point about the 90 miles a gallon, that's the gas in your car. 
you're not counting when you plug it into PG&E and PG&E runs a great big power plant using oil from wherever. What's the combined cost? So that's why I have Marin Clean Energy. I get 100% green energy at my house. Now, how do you do that at night when the wind's not blowing? Batteries? Uh, Marin, no, not, well, it could, I could have batteries. Tesla will sell you a battery. It's a great thing. But Marin Clean Energy, if I use so many kilowatt hours, let's say I use 10 a day just for a round number, kilowatt hours, they charge 20, they, they charge up and produce 20 hours during the daytime and, and bank off somebody else's uh, power f at nighttime. Or they use hydro also. They use a combination to get 100% green. And it's only a $2 a month surcharge to go from 75% green to 100. So why wouldn't you do it? Now you I don't know why my neighbors don't. <laughs> I think you, Robert You weren't does. pointing at a neighbor, were you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Now you mentioned uh, a ferry, a local ferry contract, where the um, the client was interested in a more hybrid solution. Um, how big of a contract would a contract like that be for a local ferry uh, construction? Well, I don't are these hundred million dollar contracts, fifty million? We're, we're not going to use names, but we typically are these. These are not one million dollar contracts. These are north of twenty. Well, the the, the new Hydrus class ferries were seventeen million apiece. Mm -hmm. um, the Golden Gate boats will probably be $25 million a piece. How many passengers is a $25 million? 400. 400. Mm -hmm. One thing I should mention if we have time, do we have time? We have time. Is uh, airplanes. So uh, I flew on 747s probably 150, 150 trips to, Euro to Europe and Asia. And one time I asked the captain, how much fuel does this thing use? Because in my job, that's what they would always ask me is, how much fuel do we need? How much are we going to use? So I asked the captain, how much fuel are we going to use to get over there? And there's 400 passengers. It, it works out to 57 miles per gallon per passenger, plus all the freight they're carrying. So airplanes are quite efficient because of the same reason with the picture we had of the truck going up the hill and back down. The airplane goes up and burns a lot of fuel to get up there. There's not very much air up there, so there's very little friction. And then they come back down for free. So 737 from here to Seattle gets, doesn't even burn two gallons a mile and carries 150, 180 passengers. So the fuel, fuel consumption of the aircraft is pretty low per mile. And the ferry boat's the same thing. People say, well, we could buy all these people Cadillacs and not buy a new ferry. Well, in reality, the ferries get somewhere in the 20 range, 26 gallons, 26 miles per gallon per passenger. One final question. I'm not smart in physics, but if you, talk, you were talking about sails, and how about a big container ship with sails flying in the sky? Can we, can we sail a big container ship? What's the feasibility? Oh, um, <laughs> the problem there is those container ships run between 23 and 27 knots. And the wind doesn't go that fast sometimes. But remember when we started out this conversation, I was trying to figure out how that sailboat got back over there? I guess that's where we'll end it. <laughs> uh, we've been speaking today with um, maritime engineer uh, with an unlimited license, Charlie Walther. Charlie, thank you so much for being with us. And that's uh, we adjourn the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. There we go, kids. Good on you. Thanks.